Hello, everyone. Um, hello in Facebook and in YouTube. My name is Erifili, Erifili Nikolakopoulou. I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner from Athens, Greece. And I'm here to talk about the Move Better, Feel Better Summit. And a little bonus I have for people who upgrade. So I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner, as I said. And um, I studied in, in Basel. Uh, I graduated 10 years ago now, don't tell anyone. And I'm very happy to be offering as part of the bonus series for people who upgrade and decide to support the summit, uh, five pre-recorded lessons on the eyes. They're called the open and shut cases. And uh, they're five lessons that begin fairly easy and get progressively more advanced. So the, the subject of eyes uh, was always very interesting to, interesting to me um, because although it's right in front of us, it's in our face, we use our eyes all the time, we don't think about them a lot or at all. And I find it interesting and funny how we don't pay attention to our eye movement and also how uh, big of an impact it can, it can have on our whole body. So Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais was talking about um, the dual uh, role of these sensory organs, like the mouth, which is for um, eating and also for uh, talking, the ears, which are for hearing and for um, balancing through our labyrinth, and our eyes, which are for looking, but also organize uh, the way our posture is and the whole of our spine, the way we orient ourselves. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I received uh, a very nice email uh, from a woman called Josephine Livotti. She's one of the early bird upgraders, and she already did some of my lessons. And she gracefully allowed me to share her experience. She wrote, uh, I experienced a release of tightness in my lower back. I could not shake with my morning routine. Pelvic clock, lessons, and other movements. My face was feeling softer during the lessons, and area of tight jaw was definitely freer. I am enjoying to listening to the conversation after the lesson. So when you think about her having her lower back feeling better and releasing, it sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? In, uh, in um, the ideas of uh, Moshe Feldenkrais, he talked about the elusive obvious. So something that might seem very strange can be actually very simple. How can our simple eye movements uh, make a release sensation in our lower back? Well, it is because we orient ourselves with our eyes. So your head, most of the time, is following your eye movements. So the tension in your upper neck and in your thoracic spine and the whole vertebral column kind of follows our eyes. Uh, for this, I would like, if you're interested, to try a little mini experiment. This is an experiment that I saw someone who I really love doing. Her name is Nancy Haller. She is a Feldenkrais practitioner. And I think she showed this in the 2020 Move Better Summit. And her little demo, I think, is also available on YouTube. So for a moment, can you just close your eyes and feel your face? And can you imagine now that you're looking at your cell phone, your screen in front of you, or a book with tiny, tiny, tiny letters. And as you try to make out those little tiny letters, can you feel what happens to your face and your eyes and your neck? What happens if you're trying to strain your vision in order to see something? What happens to the rest of yourself? And then can you, with closed eyes, 
throw your gaze away and imagine you're at the, your favorite vista, looking at the mountain top or the beach, and you're relaxed and gazing out at the horizon. And then check in again and see and sense how is your face and the musculature around your eyes and maybe even your neck. We don't pay attention a lot to, to those little subtle muscular movements of our eyes and face. And if you sense the difference, please send me a message so I know that you did. Now, uh, one of the most interesting thing I found because I'm kind of a Swiss army knife. I've been into dancing. Although my uh, degree was in graphic design, I was always interested in movement. Um, and uh, I found uh, studying classical Indian dance, this uh, text called the Abhinaya Darpana, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. And they already knew of the importance of the eyes. And this text writes, where the hand is, the eyes should follow. Where the eyes are, the mind should be. Where the mind is, there goes the expression. And when there is expression, emotion arises. I, I found this text beautiful because it, it, really, it really shows for a dancer how you can really direct the, the movement of the audience through the hand-eye coordination. And although in, um, in classical Europe, uh, they didn't know much about the eyes because they were trying to study it in a very different way, uh, the ancient Indian civilizations and the Asian civilizations were always much more rounded in their approach of the body and much more somatic in a way. So in uh, these lessons, we will be exploring all kinds of things around the eyes. First of all, I would like you to, to sense your eyes. And then we will begin working with fun things such as the dominant eyes. Just like our hands, uh, we have a preference, we have a dominance, right-handed or left-handed. Same thing happens with uh, our eyes. So you can think about it as have one eye leading and the other following. And there's this um, test that uh, they do when you try to go to for sharpshooting. And it's a very easy one. And if you'd like, we can test it right now. So if you look into your room and you can find a, a spot where you can gaze at something small like an, an electrical switch, for example. And then hold out your arms and make a little triangle. And then slowly, slowly close the triangle until through that little hole between your hands, you can see that little switch. And then close one eye and close the other eye. And you will see that with one eye, you can see through the hole, the switch is still there. But when you close the other eye, it's a bit off to the side. So in theory, the eye that can still see the switch is the one that's called the dominant one. And if you go to a shooting range, for example, not that I think that there is one in Europe or in Greece, but I know there's many in the States, they will ask you which eye you prefer to close in order to begin shooting. And you have to be a very advanced shooter in order to shoot with both eyes. Not that you want to shoot anything live, okay? I'm also a yoga teacher, so I'm all pro-peace. Oh, Nedi, hi. Nedi says, since a concussion, my eyes look normal, but my eyes don't feel the same especially under stress, stress. My left eye tires first. What do you suggest? Well, <laughs> you know what I'm going to suggest, right? I'm going to suggest some lovely Feldenkrais eye lessons. I think that um, 
I, I cannot give you a, a, a clear answer about your case because you had a concussion, but, and of course, you'd have to check it medically. But what you could try and do in, is sense if there's a difference in the musculature of your eyes, if you're using one more than the other. And in order to do that, you have to begin to feel around your eyes. Now, our eyes, let's think of something. Think of your eyes. For a moment, just think of your eyes. What is it that you're thinking about? For me, as for most people, when we think of an eye or try to imagine an eye, we're thinking about the iris or the eyelid. We don't think of it as a three-dimensional object. So close your eyes again for a moment and can you palpate a bit very, very gently? You don't want to put any pressure. Just palpate the roundness of the eye behind the eyelid. You can sense its curvature, right? Well, our eyes are little spheres, roughly the size of a ping pong ball. Now, close your eyes again. Can you imagine those ping pong balls in the eye socket? And you have around these ping pong balls, six muscles that allow you to move up and down, right and left and diagonally. Let's try something. Can you turn your gaze with eyes closed so that you're not distracted but by what you're seeing, but you're feeling? Can you turn your eyes to the right? Just until you begin to feel the musculature straining, just the beginning, and then to the left, and as you do, can you feel the musculature around the eye? Are you thinking of your pupils moving right and left? Could you do the same thing, but change your awareness? So that now, can you imagine those ping pong balls? And can you feel them as spheres turning around? Is that a little bit different as a sensation? Now, let it go. Open your eyes and look around. Can you at the same time allow yourself to take in the image, but also keep a part of your awareness to the movement of the eye? In uh, ancient Greece and in ancient societies in general, they believed in the theory of extra mission. So ancient physicians and philosophers like Plato and Aristotle believed that the eyes are beaming out in order to see the objects. Of course, now we know that eyes work with intromission. So it's the light of the object that comes into our eyes. But what I found, find very interesting is that this idea of extra mission kind of makes sense if you don't have the, the, the physics background or back then where we didn't know much about how the world worked, right? So can you think for a moment of gazing? You know those moments where you're standing somewhere and you feel that someone is looking at you? There is a, a power to the gaze. And for me, it was an easy conclusion to, to think that our eyes are emitting something. Oh, you can do it to the right, but not the left, Nettie says but she feels generally better. Thank you, you're welcome, Nettie. I would, I think that this is an important lesson to think about, that part of the work is about realizing the difference. If you're not aware that there is a difference, there's 
no way to change it. So it's also like in psychology, in order to, to act on the problem, you have first to be able to see the problem. So if you want to work on your eye movements, I would suggest even if you cannot afford to upgrade and, and get this bonus material, there's so much on online and so many teachers teaching right now. After the last few years, many, many people have moved online. So I'm sure there's like much offerings for you. And uh, I would look into the eyes. And I wonder, Nettie, if you feel a difference maybe also in the back of your neck or in your shoulders. So back to this idea of extra mission, can you, in Greece, you know, we have this, uh, in, in many um, Middle Eastern countries, we have the idea of the evil eye, you know, someone gazing at you so hard that you, you get their bad energy. And there's all sorts of ways to get the bad energy released if you believe in those sorts of things. But um, again, I would like to turn to the experience and I would like to invite you now to imagine with eyes closed or open that you're staring at someone you don't like at all. Someone that's been really mean to you. And as you begin to think about it, can you think, can you feel, can you pay attention to your eyes? What happens to your gaze? If there's any tension building around your nose or around the eye or in your eyebrows. And then can you think of someone you love? And what happens to your eyelids? So one of the things I really enjoy working with eyes is that because we don't pay enough attention to them, it's really easy when we do turn our attention there to feel really important differences. And sometimes in, in Feldenkrais awareness, our awareness through movement classes, things can be so subtle that we, we feel we, we don't get it. But eyes are a, a very nice way to, to introduce into this work because the changes can be felt and can be powerful for most people because they're not so subtle. So it's, it's a good entry point. Now, I would like to go into something more challenging if you're up for it. And again, it's a bit of imagery. So if you can't imagine it and you're not one of those persons that work with images, you can try and sense it. So again, can you close your eyes and feel your eyeballs and imagine those spheres inside the eye socket. Imagine how far back are they going. You can palpate again gently, gently on your eyelids so you can make sense of the top part of the sphere and imagine how long is this sphere towards the back. Can you soften your eyelids? And just for a moment, think of widening your face. And as slowly as you can, can you drop your head a bit down? And as your head drops down, can you begin to feel the weight of the eyeball on the eyelid? You can do it once or twice or a bit more, but do it slowly so that you're able to feel this gentle pressure of the eyelid as your head goes down and as gravity begins to pull on the eyeball. You can actually sense it on your eyelid. Now, the next time you're up, can you again think of, with eyes closed, turning your eyes from side to side gently, as far as it is easy, as far as there's no strain. And as your eyes turn, as if you were scanning the horizon, can you pay attention to the musculature of the right eye for a few moments, just the right, 
How is it for your right eye to be turning left and right? And then the same thing with your left eye, how it is to be turning. Is there a difference? Is there more straining in one eye or the other? And now when you're back to center, I want to try one last thing. So your eye is a sphere and in front there's a pupil. Can you imagine a pupil in the back of the eye? So in this sphere, you have the front eyeball and then you have the back eyeball, which is looking x-ray vision back through your skull to the back of the room. So now you have two sets of pupils. Can you turn your eyes and turn the front pupils? It is what we've been doing all this time, right? But now, can you bring your attention and the intention of the movement to the back pupils and begin to turn this x-ray vision in the back of your head, turning the back pupils to the left and to the right. And as you get accustomed to this movement, can you sense if there is a difference in the sensation of your head, of your neck and of your eyes when you're turning with the intention in the front pupils and when you're turning the intention with the back pupils. And you can let that go and, and have a rest. Maybe look around. I get sucked into this. I, I just wanted to show a small example and I, I get sucked into trying even more variations. And for me, that's the, the richness and the beauty of the Feldenkrais method is that there's so much variation. There's so much experimentation to do. So this kind of experiments and others are included in those five pre-recorded lessons. We even roll up uh, a piece of paper and turn ourselves into pirates to play with uh, the dominant eye and the eye periphery. And um, I've had some very uh, nice feedback, which is so encouraging because especially now in the online era, we teachers kind of lack the, the communication and the feedback. So um, these lessons are included in uh, the bonus as part of the bonus for people who upgrade for the Move Better, Feel Better Summit, which is a, a great support for the summit because it's um, I'm a Feldenkrais practitioner, but I've also been working for a few years behind the scenes of the summit. And I can tell you it's, it's quite the feat. We're, um, we're a small team. We work a lot. We're very happy and proud to be working and to be producing this, this beautiful summit, but it is daunting and support is always welcome in, uh, in emails, in testimonials, and of course, if you decide to upgrade. So this is it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Have uh, a great morning or evening. For me, it's evening here in Athens. And um, I will see you around. Bye-bye.